Welcome to Calvary Albuquerque. We pursue the God who is passionately pursuing a lost world. We do this with one another. Through worship, by the word, to the world. Hi. How's everyone doing, all right? It is so excellent to be together with you all. It's an amazing thing that we could be together, that we can learn and grow together. As uh, Pastor Skip mentioned, I've been church planning for a number of years. I'm all Italian from New Jersey, so I'm praying for you all. <laughs> and then I planted a church in San Francisco and just outside of Mill Valley, and now I'm up in Vancouver, Washington. Not Vancouver, BC, Canada, but Vancouver, Washington, which our southern neighbor is Portland, Oregon, where the motto is, keep Portland weird. So as you can imagine, I fit right in there. But I'm also sure that I'm going to be able to fit right in here with you. If you were, you were probably weren't here last night, but they had Pastor Skip's pulpit here. Your pastor is one long dude. I felt like Zacchaeus. I needed a tree to like climb up on to be able to see my notes. And so they brought me out this nice short table. You know, it's the little things that make things special, isn't it? <laughs> I want to share something with you today that I think as a pastor, as a follower of Jesus, that I want to share with something that, that burns in my heart because I see the world that we live in with its strengths and weaknesses. And I see this reality that causes us as followers of Jesus to, I think, sometimes miss the boat. In the culture we live in, we live in a culture that is all about hype. Hype is the norm. You and I are relentlessly marketed to. Every time you turn on the television, every time you turn on the radio, you go on the internet, you are constantly being bombarded with this reality that says, if you do this thing, it's going to free you from hell of whatever sort, and it's going to usher you into this exciting life. Think about it. How many of us went out and bought 4x4 SUVs because all the commercials show somebody driving that SUV in the beautiful mountains of Albuquerque? And you go out and you're like, yeah, I'm just so tired of being a suburban dad. So I'm going to go get this SUV and I'm going to have the adventure of a lifetime. Those of you with those SUVs, how many times do you actually find yourself off-roading with that thing? <laughs> Yeah, you don't, right? You just get bad gas mileage on I-25. <laughs> but it's this hype, like, man, we're going to get some adventure, but it's really just a car. You gals, there's a, there's a huge industry because our culture doesn't value getting older. Our culture values youth, but our Bibles, they don't value youth. The Bible values people. But you gals are relentlessly marketed to that if you buy this brand new anti-aging cream, it's going to release you from the hell of wrinkles. <laughs> now we know how those things work, right? They don't. <laughs> but see, it's this whole hype thing to get you to jump in because there's something that you want. Now, when you translate a hyped-up culture and you put it into the body of Christ, what you have is that we find ourselves relentlessly seeking this mountaintop Jesus experience. That it's always the next big thing, the next big thing, the next thing that we're striving for and we're moving towards. But if you look at your life, is your life one epic experience every single moment? It's not, is it? Neither is mine. See, so much of our lives are just ordinary. They're just normal. It's just a job, a marriage, the same set of neighbors, the same family of origin. And for many of us, because of this hyped up experience that everything's got to be the next new big thing, Many of us are mailing in the life that God has given us. 
We're not embracing it. But what we're going to learn today, and I believe it's from the heart of God, is that God wants you and me to not mail in our lives, but to embrace the boring and the ordinary, because that's exactly where God meets us. That's exactly where he meets us. Check this out. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 2. Is what we're going to study today. John chapter 2. I'm going to take the first 11 verses. We're going to see Jesus' first miracle. Now, if you're new to the Bible, I want, I want to get you there. Because I realize that not everybody uh, has been in church for a long time. Maybe it's your first time here. Open up that Bible. The first two-thirds of your Bible from the book of Genesis to the book of Malachi is what we call the Old Testament. It's really just everything that happened before Jesus showed up. And then you get the New Testament, which begins with what we call Gospels, or telling of the good news. There's Matthew, there's Mark, there's Luke, and then there's John. And that's where we're going, the fourth book in your New Testament. And of course, chapter 2 sits conveniently between chapters 1 and chapters 3. I figure you all already knew that, but I want to close the loop down just in case. Chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 to 11. Read along with me. It says this. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This is the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, think about how this begins. There's a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Now, Cana of Galilee was less than 10 miles from Nazareth where Jesus was raised. At this wedding, Jesus' mother is there and Jesus and his disciples are there. Now, weddings are big deals, aren't they? You think about the way weddings happen in our culture. Um, families save up for a long, long time for two or three hours, right? It's like a big colossal waste of money in the name of marriage. But that's the way we do it, right? And think about you brides, how you invite people to your wedding. You have your A list because you can have, let's say you can have 75 people at your wedding. You 75, I want these. And then you have your B list. The people on A list can't come, then we start pushing in the B list people. And then if it's really rough, then you have a C list, you know, and they get the invitation like a day before. <laughs> that, that's like the American style wedding, right? But in Jesus' day, it wasn't that way. Weddings were not a few hours long. They were a week long. And you didn't have lists of people that you invote, invited. Everybody was invited. So although a wedding was very special to the bride and groom and their family, very important, for the average person who lived in Nazareth or Cana of Galilee, you went to a lot of weddings. I mean, imagine if every time somebody in your neighborhood got married, you got invited and it lasted a week every time. Some of you are like, man, that sounds not so bad. But think about it. Weddings were commonplace. It was part of the culture. But what does this teach us? This teaches us that transformation occurs where life happens. Transformation occurs where life happens. Because weddings were common, you would have the sense of, oh, it's just another wedding. But this is the place where Jesus is going to do his first miracle. And I think for many of us, you've, we forget that God wants to transform us right where we are. Think about the J-O-B that you have. That spells job. 
how many of you wake up on Monday morning and say, it's Monday morning, I can't wait to go to work because God's going to meet me there. Anybody? Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> no, right? Because most of us are just trying to endure the work week so we can make it to the weekend. But I'm here to tell you, I believe God wants to transform you right where you are. Think about the relationships you have, your marriages. I mean, our culture is so crazy. It's like you spend your whole life saying, I'll just be, I'll really be happy when I get married. And then you get married, you're like, I'll really be happy when this is over. <laughs> Isn't that true? I mean, think about it, you're like, I'm in high school. I just can't wait to get to college. Then life begins in your college. I can't wait to get out of college. So I can have a job and you have a job. I can't wait to retire. And then you retire like, I just wish I could go back and go to college again. We live in a culture that's unsettled. It's always, it's got to be the next thing. I'll be happy when I get to the next thing. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. You are here right now. And I believe that God wants to change us where we are. I'm here to tell you, you don't need a new job. You need a new you at your job. You don't need to be out of school. You need to be a new you at your school. Do you realize that you're a paid missionary at your job? They pay you to be salt and light there. I mean, how ra self-funded missionary activity all over Albuquerque. See, when we realize that transformation happens where life happens, your job takes on a whole new light. Your family takes on a whole new light. Your neighbors and your, the other students and the faculty and all the people that you're around, it all takes on brand new life. But we need our minds renewed to grab hold of that, don't we? That makes me think of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, right? You guys know this really well. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, for many of us, we are not embracing the reality that Jesus said, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. See, Jesus never promised that our life would be one eternal slip and slide of joy. Whee! He promised that no matter what it is, he'd be with us. And the presence of God in the ordinary circumstances transforms a situation. But we need to engage our hearts and say, God, I'm going to embrace this life you've given me because I believe that transformation happens or it occurs where life happens. So this is just a wedding. Jesus' mom is there. His, Jesus and his disciples are there. And then, of course, verse 3, And when they ran out of wine... The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now, running out of wine at a wedding in Jesus' culture was one of the foremost social faux pas of what could happen. Now, these communities were close. People didn't move around like they do today. So if at your wedding they ran out of wine, you were always that couple for the rest of your life. People are like, oh, I remember your wedding. <laughs> it was a bad, talk about stumbling out of the starting gates. You did not want to be pegged as that couple. Right, but they're at this wedding and there's no wine, which is a major social faux pas. And you got to love Jesus' mom. Kind of like all moms. They have no wine. Moms, they have that, that ministry of like stating the obvious. <laughs> the moms are like, amen, and all the kids are like, uh huh. <laughs> How many times you say, I know, mom? So I, I have a little daughter. My daughter, Maranatha, I'll tell you about my kids. She's cute. And my daughter's name is Maranatha. Isn't that the dopest name ever? <laughs> Except my son. He's nine. His name is Obadiah. Oh, yeah. I'm in the running for the coolest kid names in, in the universe. I know. It's cool. I take pride in it. 
But Maranatha, she's like, she's like a little mama. She, she tries to mother me. She'd be like, I, I got the chance to baptize her. She's sick, so cool. She's like, Dad, now this is how baptism is going to work. She's like, just, I'm like, hey, I'm a pastor. <laughs> but it, it's just the way God has wired the gals, you know? It's like Mary's like, hey, they got, they got no wine. It's like, uh-huh, yeah, thanks. I knew that already. But Mary, she just states the obvious. They have no, and listen, when it comes to your mom or your, your wife or your grandma or your big sister, when they state the obvious, instead of getting mad at them, just accept the obvious. All the women are like, hey, we like Pastor Daniel. <laughs> but it's true. It's like sometimes we just resist the obvious. It's like they have no wine. What does this teach us? This teaches us that transformation seizes moments of tangible need. Transformation seizes moments of tangible need. Now, you know why I think this is interesting? Because almost everything about our culture is about making sure we don't have any needs. One of our cultural foundations is security. And we make so many decisions. They're not bad decisions. They're not sinful. But in our culture, we make all these decisions to make sure that when push comes to shove, we have everything covered. We have a huge insurance industry. We have insurance for everything, right? Maybe the, the most classic cultural example of security is the Costco card. Because God knows we need 9,000 hamburger patties in our freezer in case everybody we know shows up at one time and they need burgers. Right? Like, why buy a few rolls of toilet paper when you, I got 97 rolls. Sure, you only got one and a half bathrooms in your house and you can only use them one at a time. But you need to build a shed in the backyard because I have 97 rolls of toilet paper just, just in case. And you know what happens? You get down to like 48. We're going to get some toilet paper in this place. <laughs> this is your life too, right? This is the life I'm living. I'm like, do we, we need to buy, build a closet for the extra toiletries. Come on. Like who can use 87 ounces of toothpaste? But we do everything to not have a need. But if your life is like my life, know what you find? No matter how much you try and make everything secure, there's just, that's like a slippery fish. There's always something that slips through. And we don't know what to do. We freak out when we have a need. Why? Because we have a need and everything we've done is to not have needs. You know what I'm here to tell you? If you're here today and you have a need, then you're a prime candidate for God to do something miraculous. See, when all of human effort ends, that's where God can show himself the most profound. So instead of freaking out about a need, we need to say, God, I commit this into your hands and I trust you. See, we see issues, but God sees opportunities. This is an issue, but Jesus is there. And Jesus is going to seize this moment of tangible need and do something totally awesome. Because look at what happens. Mary says to him in verse 3, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, I don't know how you were raised. But the way I was raised, you do not call your mom woman. I mean, I just imagine my mother went home to be with the Lord when I was 21. But I just imagine being like, woman, I'd be like ducking from flying salami, you know? They'd be like garlic cloves. Now, to make matters worse, I know you all came to church today with your Greek New Testaments, right? You guys know that the New Testament was written in Greek. You know what the word for woman is in Greek? It's the word goon. <laughs> Now, a goon in sports definitions is a guy on a hockey team whose only role there is to beat people up when his team's doing bad. <laughs> now, it's one thing to call your mom woman. It's a whole other thing to call her a goon. Now, listen, just because I said it, you guys don't call your moms goons. Just because I'm not telling you to do this. And listen, moms, if your son calls you a goon, then I want you to poke him in the eye. And I told the pastors here that if guys come in with poked eyes, that they're going to go talk to them. I didn't say to do it. No, I'm having some fun. Technically, the word is gune, so it's so much better, right? 
But when you read that, Jesus calls his mom woman, you're like, like when I think of a man calling somebody a woman, it reminds me of Rocky Three. Remember that? Clubber Lang, Mr. T. Wouldn't Pastor Skip look good with a hawk? We'll work on that. I'll pray for him. <laughs> you, funny story, quick aside. You guys know Pastor Robert Ferro from Calvary Tucson. He came out of Albuquerque. Well, I remember I went to teach at Calvary Tucson with Pastor Robert. And I, I made a point. Yeah, Pastor Robert looked great with a, with a Mr. T mohawk. And the next Sunday, Pastor Robert said, oh, Fusco was making fun of me about a mohawk. I'll get one if he does. Thinking that I'm like all tied to my dreadlocks. So when I saw him, I'm like, I'll do it. And you know, Robert Froh has got like a good like pompadour, kind of red. I'm like, I'll do it. He got white as a ghost. And then I made him repent in front of the whole church. But that's a quick aside. I'm, the rails are here and Fusco's like, okay, here we go. Why do I tell you all this? Oh, because Mr. T, that's where we were. Remember Rocky III? He wants to fight Rocky Balboa. I remember he, and, and, Clubber Lang kind of crashes the press conference and he calls out Adrian, hey woman, hey woman. Every guy who watched that wants to like cr- climb through the TV and be like, you can't talk to her that way. So when I read that woman, I'm like, what? Je-? It's like, Jesus sounds like Mr. T in that. <laughs> At least that's the way it seems. But in our culture, calling your mother woman would sound negative. It, it, that would just be straight sleazy, really. But in Jesus' culture, this is an endearing term. It, it wasn't a negative term like it reads to us. But what I find fascinating about this is that Jesus only called his mother woman one other time in the Gospels. Only one. Does anyone know where it is? John chapter 19. That's right. Verse 26 when he's on the cross. Now think about what he says. His woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. My time is not yet. And then on the cross as he's making sure John the Apostle knows that he needs to take care of Jesus' mom, he says, woman, behold your son. See, in John's gospel, there's almost 10 times this phrase, my hour has not yet come. In the beginning, the first few, it's always, it's not yet come. And then after chapter 12, it's always, my time has come. Now, what does this teach us? Transformation always involves the cross. Transformation always involves the cross. See, Jesus is saying, look, my time is not yet come. This whole water and the wine. Now, you guys know from the communion table that wine is a picture of the blood of Jesus, which cleanses somebody from all their sins when they believe. And Jesus is saying, look, it's not time for me to do that yet. And then on the cross, he says, woman, behold your son. Now, she's talking, he's talking about John the apostle, but you can imagine in Mary's mind being like, now is his time. See, God transforms your life and my life by putting us at the foot of the cross. Amy Carmichael, the famous missionary, wrote this little book called If. Each page got one sentence on it. It's an if-then statement. And there's one, I remember when I read it, it just floored me. She wrote, if I love any place except the dust at the foot of the cross, then I know nothing of Calvary's love. That's powerful, isn't it? See, God wants to transform us by placing us at the cross where we see God's love and justice meeting because we failed. But not only does transformation involve the cross of Jesus, but you know, because you've studied the scriptures, and if you haven't, I want to share with you. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, what do you have to do? Deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. See, not only is the cross the, the cross of Jesus, but all of us need to come to Jesus by dying to a self-styled life and being made alive to God's life for you. See, many of us, you love Jesus, you put your faith and trust in Jesus, but you're not being transformed because you're not willing to give up your ideas about your own life and be made alive to God's ideas about your life. See, we need to die to our obsession with ourselves. And we need to say, God, what does this life look like? 
Now, this is real personal for me because Pastor Skip mentioned, I was, when I got saved, I was a, at my last semester of college, I was on the ark to play music professionally. And when I got saved, I never even thought, hey, Lord, is this the life you have for me? And I, all of a sudden, I started having that holy discontent in my life that what I was always doing, it was a gift God had given, but he didn't want me to do it with all of my energy. He had actually called me into the ministry, but I didn't ask for like two years. And you know what the thing that's amazing about when you give up your approach to your own life? I get to play more music now than I ever did when I did it as a professional. It's like the cherry on top of a life. See, when you say, God, it's not my will, but yours be done, God ignites a life that is so awesome and adventurous and amazing. I mean, like, I'm here talking to you guys, and you guys are sitting there. I mean, that's just that's mind-blowing. If I took a picture of all you and posted it with people I went to high school, would be like, they're listening to you talk about what? I was like the least likely to get saved if they had one of those categories in high school. I didn't go to Christian school, so I didn't have one of those. But I would have been like the least likely to give his life to Jesus become a pastor guy. But it's amazing what God does when we say, Lord, I'm coming to the cross. What do you want for this life? What do you want? Now, I know there's some of you in here today, maybe you're watching online and you're thinking to yourself, you know, I don't even believe in Jesus. Why would I want to give up my life so I can go to heaven? I heard that. I give up my life. So I go, no, listen. God doesn't say give up this life. You mail in your time here so you can get to heaven. You know what the Bible actually teaches? God says, I want you to give up your own version of your life. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you an abundant life now. And I'm going to give you an eternal life in the hereafter. That's the maximized life. He gives you real, abundant, profound life in his presence now. And you get an eternal life in the hereafter. Now, no matter where you're from, I call that a smoking hot deal. Go ahead, look at your neighbor and say, that's a smoking hot deal. Go ahead, tell him. And you can talk in church, don't worry. Look, look at the other person and say, that's a smoking hot deal. I can't believe you guys are talking in church, you sinners. No, I'm, just I'm just kidding. But it is a smoking hot deal. And if you're here today, you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you need to today. By the end of the service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do it. And if you're not a Christian, you need to be. You want to be. Even though maybe you got dragged here to church, you want the abundant life now and the eternal life and the hereafter. And I'm here to tell you, you know what's amazing? It's totally free. It's not cheap because it costs Jesus everything, but it's totally free. And all you have to do is say, I'm in. I'm in. Transformation always involves the cross. Now, I want you to notice what happens, right? Woman, what does it have to do with me? My time is not yet pointing to the cross. Look at what Mary does. Verse 5, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Verse 7, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. Now you notice that. Mary knows something's going to go down. She looks at the servants, whatever Jesus says, I want you to do it. These water pots, big ones, he says, I want you to fill those water pots with water. And what do they do? They fill them, not a little bit, but to the brim. What does this teach us? This teaches us that transformation flows from obedience. Transformation flows from obedience. See, Mary tells the servants, whatever Jesus says, I want you to do it. And then Jesus says, fill those water pots. And they don't just fill it up a little bit. They are completely and totally going the second mile and filling them up to the brim. For many of us in here today, you put your faith and trust in Jesus, but you look at your life like, I am not being spiritually transformed. My question would be is, where are you being disobedient? What has Jesus simply asked you to do that you refuse to do? I mean, I told, I'm raising kids. I'll tell you a story about my kids, right? So Obadiah, I told you he's crazy like his mom, right? You all know now, it's my fault. He's crazy because of me, right? So Obadiah, I'll never forget this. We're at the playground. At this point, he's probably seven and Maranoff is four. And I'm on the phone with my wife, right? And all of a sudden, I look over and there's the big slide. And Obadiah's walking up the slide with one hand. He's carrying a big wheel in the other hand. And there's little Maranatha. And she's cute. She's like a mini-me of me, except cute with no beard. Right? And, and there's Maranatha going up. And, I, and, I, and I'm on the phone with my wife and I'm like, Obadiah, 
You can't send your sister down the slide on the big wheel without a helmet on. <laughs> and my, I hear my, my wife is such a, she's, I mean, she's an angel. I mean, if you could get saved by works being married to me, you can imagine this poor gal. Pray for her, you know? She starts, she starts, what? I'm like, I'm just kidding. I'm a good enough dad to know that even with a helmet on, that's a bad scene. I'm not going to let my daughter go down the slide. I did it for my wife's sake because I'm not kind of a guy, you know. But you know what Obadiah does? He looks at me, smiles, and what does he do? He goes right back to what he was doing. Anybody ever experienced that with your kids? Yeah. It's amazing. No one ever taught them how to do that. They just, they just, they pop out ready to be rebels. You didn't sit down. Now, listen, when I, when I tell you something, I just want you to smile at me. Just keep doing whatever you were doing. It's great. But you know what's amazing about rebellion? It's not age-specific. All of you are rebels. Every single one of us, Jesus says, hey, I want you to love that person. You're like, yeah, yeah no. <laughs> God says, I want you to serve. <laughs> like, we, Jesus is the Lord, but we just don't think he's very smart. How many times has God says, yes, that's your spouse. I want you to serve them. And you're like, I've been serving them for 20 years. <laughs> Ain't no more service for you. <clears throat> Look, I've been, I've been a pastor long enough. There's Christian marriages. Man, you guys, are, you guys are living together. There's no love there. There's no joy there anymore. Because along the way, we decided we're not going to follow what Jesus says. We're just going to do what we want. Because, Lord, I've been living with them. You haven't been living with them. You don't know what he's like. You get to your job, and Jesus says, I want you to be the servant of all. You're like, I ain't serving that scoundrel. <laughs> Listen, we need to be simply obedient. Simply obedient. Listen to what Samuel told King Saul, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Some of us... We are not being transformed because we're not listening. We're saying, Lord, no. I'm here to tell you, no Lord is an oxymoron. If he's the Lord, all we can say is what? Yes. And if you say no, Lord, then what you're saying is he's not the Lord, you are. And we all know that we are not the Lord, but he is. So oh, transformation flows from obedience. Now, think about how this all happens now, right? The servants are obedient. They do what they're asked to do. And then they bring the water. Jesus says, draw it out and bring it to the master of the feast. The master of the feast tastes this water that's became wine, and he gets all out of sorts. Why? Because he just tasted some really, really good wine. Now, you realize that. When Jesus turned water into wine, he didn't make it like Mad Dog 2020 <laughs> or some boons or something like that. Now, if you know what that is, you need to repent and give your life to Jesus right now. <laughs> I didn't grow up in the church. And if you don't know what that is, praise God. <laughs> praise God. But Jesus didn't make some junk swag wine. He made some good wine. So good that the master of the feast, he comes to the bridegroom. And we'll get to that in a second. He's like, what are you doing? What does this teach us? And this is what I've been driving at. This teaches us that transformation makes the ordinary extraordinary. Transformation makes the ordinary things absolutely extraordinary. This water was there just to wash people's hands. When was the last time someone came over your house to eat dinner? Like, yeah, I'm going to get some water out the hose in the back. A little rust tasting. No, right? But Jesus takes this hand-washing water and makes a fine wine out of it. See, remember I said about how God wants to transform an ordinary, a mundane, a ho-hum existence and give it meaning? Right here. If your life seems ordinary, I believe that the presence of Jesus will make it extraordinary. But are we willing to say, okay, Lord, I'll embrace the ordinary life. I'll enjoy the mountaintops in there, but I'll embrace the ordinary life because you're going to take an ordinary life and you're going to make it extraordinary. Now look at how this ends. Right? 
This water has been made wine. The master of the feast tastes it, and he goes, runs to the bridegroom, and he gives the bridegroom a hard time. He says, don't you know that you put the good stuff out first, and then once people have drank and ate enough, they can't taste anything. And then you put the junk out. You got it all backwards. Now, have you ever been at a wedding where the bridegroom is getting dressed down by the wedding planner? No, right? Like, the bridegroom should have other, more important things to do. Like dancing with the bride, maybe taking a picture. Well, probably in that day there was no picture, so there was an artist taking a little rendition or something. This was before cell phones where the bridegroom's like Instagramming and tweeting everything. Oh, I just ate the cake, you know? But I want you to notice this, and I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up as we close this out. First, transformation creates waves. Because of this transformation that Jesus has done, now all of a sudden, everything, something's, there's a commotion happening. And what I have found is that when God is transforming a life, all of a sudden, people around them start taking notice. Like, some of you, I'm just going to be honest, some of you are just grumpy. I have a new ministry. I'm calling it DBG. Don't be grumpy. You know why? Nobody ever met a curmudgeon and said, I want to follow the person you're following. Like, grumpiness does not make Jesus attractive. When was the last time you met someone who was just sour? Like a Sour Patch Kid. You're like, oh, that's so wonderful. Can you tell me about the God you love? But if you're here and you're a grump and Jesus transforms your life, all of a sudden something happens and no longer you're grumpy, but you're kind and loving. And everyone's like, what happened to you? Where are you and what'd you do with my husband? See, transformation creates waves because now all of a sudden everyone's like, what's going on? And there's this new wine. But then in verse 11, it says, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, you and I have already read the book of Acts and you realize that this, this is the very first thing Jesus did other than saying, hey, come and follow me. Now all of a sudden he turns water into wine. It manifests his glory. His disciples believe in him. And the book of Acts teaches us that through 12, a group of 12 ragtag dudes, nobody's first team All-American, Jesus turned the whole Roman Empire right side up. Why? Because transformation should go viral. It should go viral. That as God is taking our ordinary lives and making them extraordinary, not only does that create waves because God is changing us, but now transformed people transform people. That's what I, we always talk about at Crossroads where I pastor. Say, transformed people are now flow-throughs for God to transform people. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus' mission is not just to save us so that we got it all together and we sit in church. He saves us and we come to church to be built up that you and I can be agents of reconciliation in a world. And our community and our world needs the people of God to, as God is transforming us, to be transformed transformational agents this was never meant to stay in buildings we come here and we get built up and then we go out into the highways and the byways and cyberspace and all these places with the good news we want a viral of love a virus of love and a virus of goodness and a virus of righteousness a virus of peace to begin to this will be ground zero for the beginning of a viral movement that brings glory to God and many people would believe in him. So if you're here today and you've already put your faith and trust in Jesus, but you're hearing all this stuff, you're like, man, I am gotten hard-hearted. I've gotten crusty, grumpy. You need to say, God, will you overflow my life with the Holy Spirit? Will you say, Lord, I'm like a dry sponge. I need the water of your spirit to not only soften me, but let me be useful again. I just come to him. You know what's amazing is God loves you. He accepts you just as you are, but he loves you too much to keep you that way. And if you're here today, you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to put your faith and trust in Jesus. And as I said already, listen, you know, deep down in your heart, you know that Jesus is the way. 
God's already showed it to you. That's why you're here. And I just want you to take that step of faith today. Because it's impossible to be transformed without, your, without faith in Jesus. It's, you might be able to change some behaviors, but God doesn't want to change your behaviors. Any self-help book can help you do that. God wants to change your heart. And out of the overflow of the heart, now your behaviors change. You need to come to Jesus. If you come to Jesus, that transformation, it's completed and it begins all at once. So in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I want you to respond to that. So let's bow our heads and our hearts and pray. Father, we thank you so much that you want to transform our lives, Lord. You are not afraid of where we are or who we are. But Lord, you invite us, each one of us, to step into our ordinary lives and see you begin to transform us, to take our needs and we see it as your opportunities. Lord, as you point us to the cross, you help us to walk in obedience to you. And Father, we want to see our ordinary lives just ignited with extraordinary realities because of who you are. And we, Lord, we want to create waves and we want it to go viral, Lord. We want to see the gospel a gospel movement spread from this place, even today, to reach the ends of the earth that is so many needs. Now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, there's those of you in here today, today's the day to put your faith and trust in Jesus. You know that you know that you know God's been drawing you and you've tried everything and none of it, none of it gets you what you want and you're here and you're like, I'm in, I just, I want this abundant life. I want an eternal life. If that's you, I'm gonna ask you to take a few steps of faith with me. First, I just want you to raise your hand. You're just saying yes to Jesus. Do it right now. You're saying, I want my sins forgiven. God bless you over here on my right, on the left. I see those hands. Keep them up. All the way over there on the right. I see you. God bless you. Raise those hands up high. Whether in the side rooms. Oh, I see you over there. All the way on my left. On the right side of the, of the sanctuary. Right here in the middle. God bless you. I see your hands there in the back. Oh, there's many hands going up all over the sanctuary. Keep those hands up. You're saying, yes, Lord. I'm in. I want in, God. I want my sins forgiven. I want my life changed. Now, for those of you with your hands raised, we're going to take another step of faith. Listen to what we're going to do. Jesus, he came, he lived openly and publicly. And he's saying, look, I want you to live openly and publicly for me. So this is what I'm going to have you do. I'm going to have the worship team. They're going to sing a chorus. I want you to grab your loved ones. I want you to grab your things. I want you to stand on up. And I want you to come down to the front. You're saying, I'm taking my first step of faith here today by stepping on out and saying, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Just as he came openly, you're going to step out openly. So come on down right now. Don't be scared. We'll take the time. Come on down. As everyone stands, come on down. Give your life to Jesus. Come on down to me. lot of hands. We're going to take time. I believe there's other people here who God's pulling on your heart and you're scared, but don't be scared. He died and rose again. So we're going to sing again. Just come on down. Bring your loved ones. Bring your things. Give your life to Jesus this morning. We're going to sing again. Don't be ashamed. He loves you. He's for you. Come on down. Come on down.
for each one of you. I want you to come on in close. I promise I won't bite. It's a big stage. I'm really not that scary looking. Those HD cameras do something crazy. Listen, I am so excited for each one of you. The decision that you made right now, it opens the door to a relationship with God that is absolutely astounding. And we had you come forward because our whole lives are steps like you just took. The ability to say yes to Jesus, to respond to Jesus, everything in your life is going to be that. Later today, tomorrow, Jesus is going to prompt you and you're going to say, okay. And so we wanted to do it together as a family. And I commend you because it's a big room. It could be scary. But just as Jesus came for you, we're going to step out and follow him. Now we also had you come forward because in a moment we're going to pray. And then I'm going to have you go with the pastors and the prayer counselors. Listen. However you walked in here, everything that's going on in your world is going to be going on after it's over, too, after we're done here today. And we want to give you a Bible. We want to help you lay a foundation to follow Jesus. We want to be able to come alongside you and walk with you in life. Everyone's got a story. And because you're important to God, that story is important. We want to be able to pray and encourage you. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray now. I'm going to say a line. I'm going to have you repeat a line. But listen, you need to know this. This prayer doesn't save you. As a pastor, I don't save you. Calvary Albuquerque doesn't save you. If you pray this prayer and you believe it, it means that Jesus has already saved you. That's what it means. And all we're doing is agreeing with him. So shall we do it together? So come on here close. Everyone who's standing, I just want you to raise your hands. We want God to touch each person here. I want you to repeat after me. Come on in here. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. Transform me. I believe in your life, your death on the cross, and your resurrection from the dead. Seal me with your Holy Spirit. Lead me and teach me to follow you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And all of the church will agree and say, amen and amen. What binds us together is devotion to worshiping our Heavenly Father, dedication to studying His Word, and determination to proclaim our eternal hope in Jesus Christ. For more teachings from Calvary Albuquerque and Skip Heitzig, visit calvaryabq.org.